So it's both humbling and inspiring to be here today. Can you hear me now? Hmm. Um, is that better? Okay. So it's both humbling and inspiring to be here today. And it's also um, very humbling because there's a whole lot of people in this room that know a whole lot more about the things I'm going to be talking about than I do. Okay? So we're going to start out talking about the U.S. National Plan Germ Plasma System. The background on this slide is a Native American variety called Kudu or Kudai. It's on this slide because the spots on those kernels, which is called the sacred eagle corn, are actually caused by transposable elements. And maize is unique in that it has so many mechanisms to generate diversity. It is the world's number one crop for a reason. It's not only because it's the most the largest crop in terms of farm gate value, calories consumed, economic engine driving, but it is also probably the most diverse commodity crop that we work with. This is our first known representation um, of uh, maize in art from colonial exploration. And this is taken from the Francis Drake expedition. It's in the Drake Manuscript. Uh, Jules Janik is a professor at Purdue. He is a historian who likes to combine art with germplasm discovery and understand where germplasm was when in the world. And he's a fascinating fellow to talk to. So I'm going to talk about the importance of these resources, our uh, National Plan Germplasm System, uh, our own station's mission, brief history, and then a whole lot of one, I have a whole lot more slides than I need. We're going to skip over lunch. And I have an excuse. I became a grandmother for the first time this weekend. Wow. And I did. <laughs> so I didn't do the weeding I should have done. Before. <laughs> All right. So why do we need a plant genetic resource collection? Well, most of the crops we have today we're not native to the U.S. and we're not here before European colonization. That doesn't mean the native peoples did not have more crops than this. But this graph shows where these crops develop, the agronomic crops and of origin. In North America, we had sunflowers, okay? That's pretty blank for agronomic crop origin. For fruit crops, we have the soft fruits. We have the strawberries, the raspberries, the blueberries, not a whole lot else. For vegetables, we had artichokes and jeopardy bean. There's a reason the native peoples traded up and forth, back and forth in continents across the oceans. They had to bring in the food too. The main reason we need to keep our collections vibrant and accessible is to cope with threats to food production. Not everybody can grow their own food. We need lots of food systems. We have to cope with climate change, climate variability. I read an article that said a third of all the maize production losses are simply due to climate variability. Annual temperature rainfall variation impacts yield more than any other single factor. Follow that up with insects and disease pests and the reemergence of diseases because pathogens never sleep, okay? They evolve, they adapt to whatever's out there. Uh, fertility, fertility in uh, our soils are degrading. Fertil fertilizer cost, it must be available. We need, we need intelligent systems, energy cost, water availability. We need a stable supply of adaptive cultivars. If you have a new threat emerge, you've got to deploy a new variety, you've got to do it quickly. And it may be broad or it may be a narrow geographic area, but the answer is the same. And then, of course, land use as we turn, rapidly turn our agricultural land into urban or development. So what is the 
plant system consists of. Okay, we have the base collection, which is held in Fort Collins, and they back up the collections at all of the 19 gene banks in the system. And they also conduct preservation research. Basically, it has evolved over time. It has evolved with the 
founding of the Department of Agriculture, the founding of the Division of Seed Industry, which was to support farmers becoming more productive, providing new cultivars, new plants for them to use. In the 1850 to 1900 period, there was a huge explosion of exploration activity. If you go to Miami, Fairchild Gardens are named after David Fairchild. Um, you will find thousands of accessions in a gene bank credited to his name as the donor. Frank Meyer, the Crop Science Society, awards the annual Frank Meyer Medal Award. Um, Frank traipsed all over the world. He died in China under mysterious circumstances. Then in the Rockefeller era, Latin American maize collections were uh, uh, thoroughly, thoroughly represented in the system. Okay, so you've got all this stuff, but are you keeping it alive? Well, it was recognized that we needed organized activities and we needed infrastructure to maintain and ensure that it would be available. So in 1948, the station that I'm at in Ames, Iowa, it was opened. It was the first plant introduction station. In 1970, the U.S. experienced the Southern Corn Leaf epidemic. The National Academy of Science jumped into action. They recognized the gen genetic vulnerability of our food system. Um, and people got serious about understanding the genetics of what was involved in these varieties. So today we are advised by a system of uh, uh, individuals that have responsibility for developing vulnerability assessment statements and, and helping us acquire and deploy germplasm. If you look at the map of the U.S. stations imposed on the plant zone hardiness map of the U.S., you see they're spread out. On the west coast, uh, we have three clonal crop stations. And then Parlier is kind of unique. It was started as a site with a Mediterranean climate where all of us could send material that we couldn't propagate readily in our own stations. Fort Collins is the base collection, the long-term preservation center. Ames, we have, I'll show you what we have later. Sturgeon Bay, potatoes, college station, cotton, uh, cons, Stuttgart is rice, um, Columbus is the ornamental <coughs> plant germplasm center. Um, Miami and Hilo have the subtropical and tropicals. The list goes on. Oh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen is huge. That's a small grains collection. Wheat, rice, barley, you name it. Caitlin already told us about access. Um, we also have a lot of access requirements within the U.S. Our curators probably spend one to two years developing a collection proposal and collecting all the necessary permits that may be involved in acquiring germplasm legally. <clears throat> but as a result, we have Dr. Spooner here with his colleague in Peru collecting wild germplasm. As a result, we have this wealth of resources. Um, this is our our uh, oil seed curator, Laura Merrick and Ames. She and her colleague are collecting wild sunflower, but they're actually in a boat. They're in a river bank in California, in a uh, species that grows only there. We also have a curator in Ames who's kind of leading the charge to collect ash seeds and ensure that we have representation of ash before it disappears from our landscape. When we lost our elms and our chestnut, trees, we were not able to collect. It was an after-the-fact hole. Oh, we should have had that. And now there are remnant survivors, but we don't have a thorough gene pool to dip into to reestablish these trees. So what do we use them for? Um, breeders, educators, they use them for variety improvement, for understanding the nature of biological diversity, um, we develop new crops, new uses, improved health, nutrition. That's kind of hard to say after listening to the chef. Um, biofuels, ecosystem functions, um, reestablishment of even prairies and ecosystems, and then repatriation to other countries where their gene banks have lost their holdings for one reason or another. 
I think we've repatriated Ethiopia's germplasm on three occasions at least, as they lost their germplasm due to famine and civil war. And Afghanistan, um, during the early Taliban years, looters vandalized their gene bank, dumped all the seeds in the jars on the floor, and stole the jars. So, you know, value systems you know, are a concern. So our mission is to develop these collections and conserve and maintain them, characterize them, document them, and distribute them and the information associated with them. So each of these functions are not an island. They're all integrated. They all weave into each other. And if we need external sources, that's a process. Once they're distributed, and learning and discoveries are realized, that information feeds back into the system. The curators are going to associate the citations on the research with the accessions in the database, and that if it's provided to them. And that is also publicly available. So we can't effectively do our job unless we can effectively use information. And so we have a, a, a fairly in-depth effort at software development at our station to really provide the tools that the curators need to do their jobs and for the public to have the information associated with them. Let's see, on, the, on what you can see as your right side would be all the publicly facing information in the database, and on the left side would be what the curators see internally. Um, the phytosanitary testing results, any diagnostics, quarantine status, um, phytosanitary certifications are required to export seed to various countries. They all have their own restrictions for good reasons. Um, when a requester gets an envelope of seed, they're also going to see a reference on that seed to a viability testing method or a propagation method. And they can go online and look those up as well. And this is where you go to find information, www.ars-green.gov. And from there, you can do a whole lot of queries. So what we do in AIMS is focus on heterogeneous heterozygous outcrossing crops. That's what we specialize in, as well as the information management tools. This is what our station looks like from the air. Obviously, it was early in the season. And all those little boxes, those are screen cages. And in those screen cages, plants are growing with pollinator insects. A large number of our crops are actually insect pollinated. And so our entomology team has to provide insects on demand, six different insects on demand during the flowering season. This is our seed storage maintained at 4C. 25%, 30% relative humidity. Um, this slide, I think, is important. This gives you an idea of the scope of the MPGS holdings. And I really wish this worked as a pointer, but it's, oops, it's definitely not going to. In the collection as a whole, there's close to 600,000 different plant varieties. In Ames, we have about 9% of those but we're responsible for 21% of what's distributed. Um, just in 2017 alone, the U.S. distributed over 260,000 packets or plants to researchers and educators for their objectives. These four stations alone account for 74% of all the resources that are distributed annually, and that reflects the nature of the crops they hold and the nature of the research demand. So in Ames, uh, maize makes up about 40% of the collection. And we have the oil seeds of sunflower, the oil seed brassica, we have uh, cucumbers, carrots, cantaloupe, pumpkin, squash. We have a few medicinal plants, echinacea, hypericum, bacteria, uh, woody and herbaceous ornamentals. And even though that purple is a very small slice of the pie, that's where the bulk of the taxa are. Um, and then the amaranth curator also has perilla, quinoa, spinach, etc. 
If we look at how maize came to us from its early evolution in Central America, and we look at the inflorescence of the teosinte and those little hard cupules, not really hard, but cupules, and inside those cupules, which you can hit with a hammer when they're dry and they don't break, and you're going to chip them with nail clippers in order to germinate them and soak them, there's been this huge divergence genetically. And so the collection has grown to represent the diversity. And when Mark Miller, the maze curator, started almost 38 years ago, there were about 2,000 accessions in the maze collection. And now there's over 21,000. Um, they are not all available. As we get new accessions, it's kind of hard to keep pace with keeping them available because you have finite resources. Um, and when we look at how the collection is broken up, we have inbred lines. We have two types of inbreds. We have those that are expired plant variety protected lines. And we have all other inbreds. And then we have some lines coming out of the germplasm and hence the maize program as well. The populations make up about 82% of the collection. In terms of demand, about 23% of the distributions are these segregating populations every year. Whereas nearly 70% altogether is responsible, it is the demand is for inbreds. Okay? The teosintes are very difficult to maintain. Um, let's get these. There's a lot of challenges to maintaining these diverse resources. You've got adaptation differences. Are they tropical? Are they temperate? Are they photoperiod sensitive? Are they not? Um, the maturity, we start pollinating June 1 and we quit at Labor Day. We quit at Labor Day so that they mature before it freezes or we could keep going. The reproductive physiology are, are very different between the maize, the tisa, and the triscum. And you use different methods to maintain the genetic integrity of whether it's a population or an inbred or a synthetic. And I don't have much more time, do I, Dave? Uh, three, four minutes. Okay. So this is an image. Um, the greenhouse is gas bay flint, which is one of the earliest accessions. It's about two foot tall. The ear shoots are ground level. If we grow it in the field, the mice eat it before it matures. The teosinte has crawled up to the, the roof and it's curled over and it's going to get chopped off and rooted, put out in the field in pots for the summer, brought back in next winter, and maybe within two years you're going to get seen. So, you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into regenerating teosinte seeds. Um, we use a photoperiod shade house to fool it. If you create this little cage that you cover up every day and uncover and give it eight hours of sunlight only for six weeks, you can fool a tropical into flowering with a temper. Okay. Um, this is a mirror image planting. The plants outside of the structure were not covered and you shorten up the flowering by two to three weeks on some of these lines. So we have all these maize races from North America. The three with stars are those that really contributed to commercial maize today, okay? And classification has mainly been based on ear morphology in the past, but today we have to genetically characterize them all and learn. And this figure is taken from the work of Jeff Ross Barris Lab in California. And this analysis um, by Van Heerwey basically is relating geographic origins to population structure. And it's showing you how different they are from each other genetically. And I can tell I'm boring some people, so I will move on. <laughs> <laughs> so we classify them phenotypically, uh, phenology, composition, molecular markers. We send them out to cooperators for disease resistance evaluations. 240 of them have a traceable affiliation to a Native American <coughs> tribe that, based on passport data. And there are a lot more in the collection that are Native American, but we don't have enough information to associate them with a specific tribe. Um, 
I saw um, Jessica look like your scenes were Bronze Beauty. Bronze Beauty has an interesting story. Our maze curator is pretty sure that it was derived somehow from Chocolate because of the unique color, and that's the only land race he's ever seen this unique bronzy brown color. And the Bronze Beauty accession came to us through this fellow, Heineck, who donated it in 1978. The other unique part of it, it's a little different. It's got a lot of narrow curves on a higher row number. So we have all these challenges, which led us to start the GEM project, the Germplasm Enhancement of Maize, to increase the diversity of maize in farmers' fields and for the users. And why did we need gem? Well, we've got 80, 90, sometimes 100 million acres of corn that are based on just a couple of land raises. And all of the production is single process. Industry can't go back to land raises. If they're going to use genetic information and land race data, they're going to look for a signal for, say, a disease resistance. Then they're going to go back to their library of elite lines and find which of those has the signal similar and try to use this instead so they don't lose time. Because you're looking at a 20 year effort to just catch up. There's so much drag that comes with using the land race. So some of our material is just used for discovery as opposed to actually variety development. Mm -hmm. um, in the GEM project, it's a public-private participation there's lots of entities, uh, universities, private companies, internationals, and they all use exotic germplasm <coughs> to develop pre-breeding material, which can then be used to diversify our genetic base. Um, there's two programs in the U.S. that coordinate this. 50% tropicals are done in Raleigh and the 25% tropicals in Ames. And we've had over 60 races contribute to our releases, which is pretty unique. We've also released double haploid lines. I'm not going to go into that. Um, these lines have been genotyped. That genotypic and phenotypic information is available through Panzea for anyone who's interested. Um, we feel this is very important in order to meet challenges to production in the future. And the, and the Private sector would not be partnering with us if they did not think it important also. These are some of the big global threats. If you get late wilt, you are always going to have late wilt. It's a soil borne fungus, and once you have it, you can get rid of it. In Egypt and India, they have late wilt. It's in Spain. Um, they have to go through variety trials, and variety has to have no more than 1% disease plants in order to be commercialized. It's a very big deal. There's viruses that are always becoming new threats. Um, Northern leaf blight, it was a problem, it wasn't a problem, now it's a problem. <coughs> Pathogens never sleep. So, David, I think I've used up my time, correct? Okay. Through here. So, the thought to consider is what is the dividend from a maze collection? What is the dividend beyond insurance? So, we leverage them to understand, to improve breeding, and to improve crop production. And how well we utilize that information is going to depend on how intelligently we use it and what we choose to apply it to. So I'd like to acknowledge the people who do the real work, Mark Miller, our base curator at Ames, and Lisa Burke, who is the curator of the cold room, and all the staff in the collaboration.